Let me welcome you today, uh, this final Sunday of June. And um, today's message uh, is one that comes from the story that Jesus tells, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the title of the message is, Who is My Neighbor? So I'm going to, first of all, just read you the parable from Luke 10, 30 through 37. And then we'll get into just uh, exploring this uh, the issues that, that brought about this parable. Uh, so it says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. Uh, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him and bandaged his wounds, poured in the oil and the wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him until I return. I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So which of these three, Jesus asking this, which of you three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law, the lawyer, replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So this story Jesus tells of the Good Samaritan is a story that arises out of a question from a lawyer. And just going before he tells the parable, it's in Luke 10, 25, 29, there's a discourse between Jesus and this lawyer. And it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? Uh, What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, And with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered, (laughs) and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself and said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Now the Greek word for neighbor uh, is, means someone who lives close by, someone nearby, somebody who we usually understand the neighbor. Somebody may be living adjacent to us in a property, the house next door or on the right or the left of us or maybe across the street. And so, you know, the neighbor is somebody that's understood who's close by, but it could mean somebody who's close by in your community, could mean your nation. Uh, so there's a number of understandings you could have as a neighbor. For instance, uh, we share a border, the longest border uh, from Atlantic to the Pacific with the United States. where Uh, a neighbor. We're a neighbor nation in that regard. So, uh, you know, but the religious leaders and lawyers often ask Jesus these questions to test him. And they hoped in attesting him that they would expose him as less knowledgeable than them. That usually never really, though that never really happened. Um, Because they were trying to draw Jesus, uh, the attention of the people away from Jesus and back onto them. And this was the case with the lawyer's question. When the lawyer asked how to in, he would inherit eternal life, Jesus responded by asking him what was written in the law and what his understanding of it was. And, of course, in Luke 10, 27, he says, love, you know, to repeat it, he said, I love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus replies, do this and you will live. But the lawyer, it says, wanted to justify himself. And in this context of he wanted to justify him, something has bothered him uh, concerning the love of the neighbor. Everything else he kind of accepts, but the love of the neighbor challenges him in some way. And this is, you know, the, the last statement of the great commandment to love the neighbor. And it stirs in the, the lawyer's heart uh, a need that perhaps he... Uh, you know, he's not fully uh, embracing uh, that part of the commandment. Uh, he's looking to justify himself. That is that his interpretation of what his neighbor would be uh, 
He wants Jesus to qualify that as an acceptable uh, view of a neighbor. So he's, uh, he's a specialist in the law in this religious group, and he would know the law very well. But Jesus also knows the law very well because Jesus um, uh, was actually the giver of the law, the Mosaic law he authored <laughs> and gave to Moses. Uh, someone, so some, you know, some people view the same race as their neighbor, the same countrymen, the same city, the same social group, or your, 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 you know, just even your family, that you look at that as your neighbor and your neighborhood, and you don't look too far beyond that. And so Jesus responds to this question about who is the neighbor, not with uh, giving him a direct answer, but by telling the Samaritan story. And he chooses a Samaritan as his hero for the story. And he chooses the Jericho Road as the backdrop of this drama on the road of the man beaten and uh, left to die and the people that uh, come in contact with the man. So the parable has to be understood really in the context. Although it's a story of compassion and love, and that's an important part of it, there's a greater context here of uh, the Samaritan and his background and what he comes from and his encounter with a Jewish man bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road. So, you know, uh, you know, we're living in a time, we're very aware of the time we live in, that there's increased tension around the whole issue of uh, people groups and them conflicting with one another, whether it's what we're seeing in the United States with vast protests as a result of police violence, and then we're seeing, you know, immigration, large groups of people trying to immigrate to places and being resisted, and we just see the history of humanity that is punctuated regularly with genocide, nations rising against nation, uh, and all this hatred of people groups uh, that are around us, with uh, rooted in prejudices uh, towards races, nationalities, religious affiliations. But, you know, Jesus confronted every issue known to humanity. In the three and a half years of ministry, there was not... Uh, anything about human issues and challenges that the human race had that Jesus in some way didn't confront. And he confronts this prejudice that the Israelites have, that the Jews have towards the Samaritans through this story. And in Jesus' time, the nation of Israel had this very strong prejudice against the nation of Samaria. Uh, for some 500 years, this had developed and uh, was deeply programmed into the culture of Israel at Jesus' time. Samaria at one time had been the northern kingdom of Israel. So you need to see the context of how this developed. After King Solomon's reign, you know, the uh, nation of Israel that David and Solomon had solidified and made into a great nation split. And there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And so both kingdoms became, over a period of time, uh, through poor leadership and uh, idolatrous kings that came. They both rebelled. And the first nation that fell, the northern kingdom, fell to the Assyrians after many waves of invasion. Uh, from about 700 B.C., they were overtaken uh, by the Assyrian Empire. And in, when they overtook that empire, they depopulated the Jewish population for the most part. They perhaps left a, a, a marginal amount of Jewish people in the northern kingdom, but they took everybody else out because they had this population control policy in their empire where they displaced people from different nations and put them in another nation. So they took the Jews and took them to another nation and put them there, and then they brought another nation into uh, the northern kingdom, into Israel, and placed them there. So uh, there was a different race of people that came in and dominated the society for a while. Although, and they intermarried with the remaining Jewish population. So the, you know, the Jews of Judea, the southern kingdom, uh, and, the, and the people of Galilee, which were uh, purely Jewish, uh, did, not, uh, did not associate with these people. They considered them heathen. They considered them half-breeds. So they began to segregate themselves from them, separate themselves from them. They no longer regarded them as part of the Jewish culture or population. 
They limited them. They did not allow them to participate in the temple worship in Jerusalem. So there's all kinds of segregation type uh, policies that they uh, kept uh, the Samaritans in. So the Samaritans were in effect oppressed by uh, the Jews that were the Jewish nations that were around them, the Galilee and Judea. Uh, so they held this, you know, and this inherent hatred of them was of course, passed through generations, and it was enforced by the religious leadership uh, in uh, Jerusalem. And so they became a marginalized people. But as far as Jesus was concerned, uh, they were part of Israel and deserved to hear the kingdom message that he brought. And so he had, was in, very intentional about making sure that he did minister into Samaria. And in Luke 9, 51, 56, we see he travels through Samaria in the villages to bring his message to the Samaritan people. It says, that, it says this, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that is close to the end of his ministry, and he's, he, he says he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So it wasn't far off before his uh, arrest, uh, crucifixion, and uh, those events uh, that he passed, he did this ministry in uh, Samaria. And, and he sent messengers before his face, it says, and as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. So he had a, uh, a distinct plan to uh, cover off ministry in Samaria. And as they went, they entered a village to prepare for him, but they did not receive him. So there was already, uh, there was some rejection in Samaria because of this longstanding uh, you know, discord and hatred between the Jew and the Samaritans. So they didn't receive him because his face was set to journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? And Jesus, in verse 55, it says, but he turned, Jesus, and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So he continued to minister there. But we see even in his disciples this inherent disdain and uh, uh, discrimination uh, and hatred to the point where they would, you know, like to be able to call down fire on them. So even the di disciples, they demonstrate this uh, inherent racist and discriminatory attitude towards the... Um, Samaritan people. So this was widespread. This was what you would call inherent. That is, it's been bred through the generations because this had started some 500 years ago. And uh, of course, Jesus affirms his purpose is not to destroy, but to save them. So Jesus is the sole person at this time, I would probably say, in Israel that had a whole different attitude about the Samaritans. Jesus was aware of this hatred the Jews had towards the Samaritans from his own childhood. Remember, Jesus was raised in Galilee. That was the nation that was at the north side of Samaria. So Samaria was sandwiched between Galilee and Judea. And Jesus' family, of course, uh, they, they, they lived in that area for a long time. But, you know, they would travel annually at least three times a year down to Jerusalem uh, because the requirement for devout Jews, and, of course, his family were devout Jews, was that at the, the family, or the, at least the males in the family, had to attend uh, at least three of the seven feasts uh, uh, in the calendar of, uh, uh, of worship. And those three that were required were Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. So at least three times a year, the family would travel down to uh, Jerusalem. And in doing so, they would bypass uh, they would not travel through Samaria. They didn't want to travel through there, so they would circumvent uh, Samaria by traveling down the east side of the Jordan and traveling down that way and then coming up, uh, crossing the Jordan again at Jericho and then coming from Jericho up to Jerusalem. And that last leg of the journey, the Jericho Road, where the events Jesus describes in his story about the robbers and the a uh, man on the Jericho Road was a treacherous piece of uh, travel. It was rugged. 
It was only 17 miles, but the elevation difference between Jericho and Jerusalem is 4,000 feet. So it's an arduous journey, this last leg. But, you know, this arduous journey is, um, uh, was not necessary. If they had gone straight south from Galilee through Samaria to Jerusalem, to Judea, uh, it would be, take them only half the time, and it would be a less arduous, arduous journey. It would be easier for them. Uh, they would reduce the time by one half, but they added to the time it took to get there. They made it harder on themselves. The old Jericho Road uh, is still there. You can travel it today. Now there's a big highway there, but there's still the old remains of the Jericho Road. It's rugged, very rocky, and uh, it's, at that time, it became a, a haven for robbers and thieves, thieves and uh, many people were killed uh, as they traveled up there. So they tended to travel in large groups so that they could avoid um, being overwhelmed by robbers, but it was well known. Uh, and was, in fact, named the way of blood, the way of blood. So um, this kind of speaks a couple of things to us because it speaks to the fact that prejudice and discrimination, these kinds of things, create a hard road for humanity. They create a hard road. The Jericho Road was a hard route to take uh, to get to their place of worship. But, you know, when we adopt that kind of an attitude, we're going to make life's journey harder. Not just on the people that we persecute and we uh, segregate or separate ourselves from, but ourselves as well. Because you, you, uh, you know, this is a picture of that. It took longer, it was a harder journey, and there was also the violence that was connected with uh, dis this discrimination that on the Jericho Road. So it's a couple of pictures there. The way of blood. Blood, so much blood, people, has been shed over prejudice and discrimination between people groups. When you consider history and the amount of um, violence and bloodshed that's been spilled over people groups that uh, are opposed to one another or are uh, suppressing one another. When you think of uh, all the genocides that have taken place and all the uh, things that have happened, enslaving people, and all these things that have taken place in history have left scars and violence and even trauma in people that you even see today and that we're witnessing today. So such was Israel with regard to Samaria. And, uh, you know, but Jesus throughout his ministry, he demonstrated a love for the Samaritan people. And, of course, one of the best known stories of his demonstration of that is his encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well in Samaria where he ministers to her, reveals himself as Messiah, and uh, she becomes saved and brings the whole village out to hear him speak uh, about the kingdom of God. So, you know, there's... You, you see this in his ministry. You even see at the end of his ministry when he's ascending to heaven and he gives the great commission in Acts 1 and 8, he says, you know, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria. He made sure Samaria was included in the program of the gospel, that the disciples and the, uh, the apostles that followed him were to make sure that uh, Samaria heard the word of God. And, of course, Philip went in there uh, shortly, uh, early in the book of Acts, and ministered the gospel and saw many salvations and miracles there. So returning to that question, that question, who is my neighbor? You know, Jesus in this story chooses a Samaritan as his hero. And, you know, that would be a surprise to the lawyer and everybody else that was listening to the story that Jesus would select a Samaritan, these people that are detested and rejected, to be the hero of the story. And so, you know, his audience had probably never heard anything good about a Samaritan. Jesus is raising this Samaritan up as, a, as good and righteous and loving and compassionate and willing to help uh, a Jewish person on the Jericho Road. You know, this person that he stopped to help was somebody who probably had the same attitude the rest of Israel had. That, you know, they didn't want anything to do with Samaritans. But here a Samaritan comes to help him. And it says, you know, what he does, um, he, he bandages his wounds. He uh, pours in oil and wine. He, he puts him on his own donkey, takes him to uh, a place where he can recover, and he pays an innkeeper. And he, return, he promises to return. So all these things of 
righteous works that, um, uh, that would surprise or, or kind of almost shock them why Jesus would be using a Samaritan for this. But Jesus wants to expose the fact that these neighbors of theirs, the Samaritans were a neighbor, uh, that they had rejected that um, was, was, was wrong. So here we are, we're, we see this man releasing unconditional love to this wounded, dying uh, man who would surely have died on the road, also passed by. He was passed by, of course, initially by, a, it says, a priest and a Levite passed him by. And here Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders because they were actually guilty of passing by their own people. That is, they had a discrimination amongst themselves that they didn't include uh, the, what they have viewed as the sinner society or the uh, lower class of Israel uh, in their ministry. All they did was kind of parade themselves uh, before them, but they didn't actually minister to them. And Jesus said, you know, both a Levite and a priest pass by on the other side. You know, this speaks to the times too. It's time that people are more involved in helping other people from their situation. And we see this in, in even the protests in the United States that more people are gathering and, and getting involved in the protest against violence and discrimination against black people in America uh, because something stirred in there. Uh, something's been stirred up. And Jesus, you know, Jesus was the great lover of people. And so we see even in our time that um, uh, we're looking, you know, God's looking for people to be involved in lifting other people up and not putting other people down. You know, and it's only the problem that we have, though, is the context sometimes of our own traditions. You know, when sometimes we just want to stay where we are and we just want to pass by on the other side. We want to stay uh, with the context of history and tradition that we have. And so, but you know what, the only thing that's going to change things is going to be the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. Because our traditions, Jesus said, um, make the Word of God of no effect. So sometimes we need to look at our traditions and our culture and say, what, about, what is it about my traditions and my culture that are the limitations between the liberation of other groups of people? What is it in my background, in my historical perspective, that is blinding me to, uh, to reach out to other people and to be involved in actively uh, raising people up as this good Samaritan did. And so in Matthew 5, 44, uh, Jesus said this, You have heard it said, love your enemies and hate your, uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who spitefully use you. And this is exactly what the Good Samaritan did on the Jericho Road, is although he was a part of a people group that was uh, despised, rejected and uh, by the Jewish people, he stopped and helped a Jewish man on that road who was uh, injured and needed help. And so there wasn't any help that came from his own people. Uh, they passed him by. But this Samaritan stopped to help him. So Jesus is really, you know putting this story out to, to address the issue that's pretty broad across Israel. And so the, Amer the Samaritan did not allow the prejudice of others to hinder the flow of God's love through him. He didn't allow the prejudice that was focused towards him and his people to stop him or hinder him from ministering the flow of God's love. How many know God, the, the good Samaritan really is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ? The character and nature of Jesus Christ is what's being exposed in this story of the Good Samaritan. The lawyer, of course, he could give no other answer when Jesus asked him, which of the three that encountered the man, which was the neighbor? And so Jesus, uh, being the good lawyer that Jesus is, he had just set this lawyer up uh, through this story to answer his own question. Now, the question is, who is the neighbor? Well, without a doubt, he said, it's the one who showed mercy. And so we see that. That in this time period, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious group, uh, they had burdened the people with a lot of laws and regulations, but they hadn't ministered the love of God to them. And Jesus said to the, them in, in this in Luke 11 and 46, he said, Jesus said to the experts of the law, 
You experts of the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they cannot carry. That is a lot of rules and regulations. But you yourselves will not lift a finger to help them. And that's what we saw in the picture of the Levite and the priest. They didn't stop uh, to lift a finger to help this man. You know, it says uh, to be prejudiced. To be prejudiced is that you are one who prejudges. The word prejudice comes from prejudge. And, and that is what, what we do when we prejudge is we make uninformed, ignorant judgments on another person or another people group uh, with no basis in fact. In fact, it's often a distorted judgment through uh, information that's incorrect. And, you know, Jesus provided wisdom concerning our inclination to pass judgment on people. Uh, and he did this in the uh, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. He spoke this in verses 1 and 2 of 7. From the Amplified Version, he said this, Do not judge, condemn, and criticize others, that you may not be judged and condemned and criticized yourself. Just as you judge, condemn, and criticize others, so shall you be judged, condemned, and criticized. And in accordance with the measure you use to deal it out, so shall it be dealt out to you again. You see, people tend to criticize and judge and condemn, and what they do is they're sowing seeds that they will reap exactly what they sow. But conversely, people, conversely, there are blessings to reap in operating in mercy and love. There are blessings to reap. And Jesus uh, brought that out in the same, in, in Luke 6, 36 through 38. Again, the Amplified, it says, So be merciful, sympathetic, tender, and responsive, even as your Father is of all these, neither pronouncing judgment nor, cur nor censure, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and pronounce guilty, and you will not be condemned and pronounced guilty. Acquit, forgive, and release resentment. Let it drop, and you will be acquitted and forgiven and released. Give, it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. They will pour into the pouch formed by the bosom of your robe used as a bag. For the measure you deal out and confer benefits to another will be measured back to you. So this principle of what you put out there will be measured back to you. And notice... Uh, that it doesn't mention that it's God that gives back, although through people he gives back, but it says they, they will give back. People somehow in the earth, God will get people uh, to respond to your kindness. Maybe they're not even connected to the kindness you're doing, but somehow God will flow that back to you in an abundance. It will be measured back to you. Therefore, if we frequently judge people, we find others will similarly make judgments on us. That's how prejudice multiplies and grows. You know, the devil's real quick to encourage you to judge people's motives and intentions. So, you know, what is judgment? You know, judgment is the pronouncement of an opinion on another person or group of persons that usually relates to right or wrong, good or evil. Let me say that one more time. Judgment is the pronouncement of an opinion on another person or group of persons that usually relates to right or wrong, good or evil. Remember, you know, it says in this definition that it's an opinion, not a truth. An opinion is formed out of our own frames of reference. Historical, family, culture, tradition, all these things weigh into what develops in us as opinions about other people. You might think of it like eyeglasses, you know, that you're wearing, that I'm wearing. That rather than correcting your view, uh, you see things as you see things. They actually result in a distortion of view. You see three, through th things through the lens of your own perspective, your own culture, and background, and what you've heard other people say, what you've been taught, and often that's not correct what you've been taught. And together with all those things, those experience, whether it be family, tradition, culture, nation. Uh, they, relate, they bring our experiences together to give us a perspective. And so we look through these eyeglasses of that perspective. And through that, we draw the wrong conclusions. And likewise, out of those conclusions, we make the wrong decisions. And this is a result of walking, as we know it as believers, walking after the flesh and not the spirit. 
Because Jesus, when we're born again, we get a new pair of glasses, people. What we get is his presence in us. We get his spirit in us, and we get his word. So you might look at your eyeglasses of a, as a Christian as the vision that you look through. What you look through is the word of God and the spirit of God. Those two lenses make up the perfect vision that God wants you to have towards yourself and towards other people. And Paul wrote this in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.16. He, says that, he said this in the New King James Version, Therefore, from now on, we regard nobody. We don't regard no one according, we regard no one according to the flesh. And in the NLT, it says this, a little more simpler for us to understand. So we have stopped, it says, we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view, from a fleshly or from just a physical point of view. We don't look, Paul says, anymore at people that we encounter based on their race, their nation, their, you know, their traditions, their religion. We don't look at people that way anymore. We've stopped doing that, Paul says. And uh, because our only hope, people, is to follow the instructions given to us in relationship with people through the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of the Word of God through the apostles and to walk in the Spirit. So we have these two resources, our two new lenses to view society and to view what the events around us with, and that is the Spirit and the Word, because they always agree. God's Spirit and God's Word always agree. And the only person we should, and just in summary here, as I just begin to wind this down, the only person we should be focusing, ju judging on is ourselves. And let me just take you to Psalm 139 and, and verse 23, 24, and what it says about uh, the search of God in our hearts. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of the everlasting. That is in the way of the spiritual life. We are expected to ask the Holy Spirit to search us and guide us and correct us and bring us to repentance over issues that are causing discord in our hearts that are wrong. And, and you know, we have to understand Jesus received the judgment for all mankind, that is what was due my, me as judgment, what was due you as judgment for the sins you've gathered up. Jesus has already taken those, been judged for those, bore those sins on the cross, those judgments. And so he's taken them all for us. So when I received Christ, I forfeited, listen, I forfeited, as you did, any right to judge my neighbor's heart. Because just as Jesus bore my judgment, he bore my neighbor's judgment. And everyone else, when I judge the hearts of others, I'm trespassing into what is Christ's territory alone. Because he is the sole righteous judge. He's the only one that really qualifies as a righteous judge. And really legitimately, the only area I can legitimately judge people, because we need to discern and make evaluations of people in order to determine what relationships we should be in and what relationships we should not be in. But we can only legitimately judge people based on their fruit. We're called to look at their lives, Matthew 7 and 20. Therefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. So we can know people by what they do outwardly and get some determination in the way they treat people, uh, in their attitudes, and just in their conversations. Uh, we understand uh, from that that this is somebody who's you know, flowing positively, has a good attitude, so you may want to acquaint with them. Uh, but if we're just left to ourselves without the Holy Spirit working in us, uh, we sometimes go and move into making assumptions and value judgments on people that are based, again, out of the flesh, out of that thing that Paul said we should stop doing, no longer evaluating people uh, based on their physic physical uh, things. And you see, the enemy will draw us into easily evil surmising about people and will create strife and division when we begin to make judgments, decisions out of those distorted surmisings that are basically out of uh, a heart that is wicked that has not been judging itself. If we judge our hearts, we would keep them pure and be able to discern uh, uh, people in, in the correct way. In Matthew 24, 12, uh, Jesus said, because iniquity abounds, the love of many has grown cold. So because sin is so apparent and so widespread uh, that people get cold in relationships to people. So we need to keep 
our hearts tuned to the Holy Spirit, tuned to the Word of God. We live in a time when sin of judgment and prejudice abounds. And um, it results in the creating of hatred among people. And we need God's grace and power, people, uh, in our lives to change us. And so, you know, that's what we need. We all need the Holy Spirit and change. The only hope how to bring uh, humanity to peace and to bring humanity together is the Lord Jesus Christ. And through the work of the Holy Spirit and the Word in believers, we can become more civil and be effective as the Good Samaritan was on the road, uh, on the Jericho Road. Uh, so we need to seek to abound in love. And so I'm just going to end in a prayer. And uh, I want you to consider holding up our good neighbor, the United States, in prayer. The United States is in a difficult situation. The world's in a difficult situation, but I look south and I see great difficulty with, you know, they've, they've got large numbers of suffering under the COVID. They're at a, over 120,000 deaths in three months. Uh, we have the problem, but it's nowhere near the magnitude of the U.S. And then, of course, they've had this eruption of protest in the face of the violence against uh, uh, young black men in the United States. So they're facing great difficulties, and I truly see them in, in a season where they're on, uh, they're, they're on the hard journey of the Jericho Road. And so we need to pray for them. And I'd just like to pray for uh, these things uh, as we just end. Father, I just thank you that you bring peace through the gospel, through the message that Jesus left with us, to bring to people, Lord God, uh, that they can, they can sh have the Holy Spirit shed the love of God abroad in their hearts, that there can be peace, Lord God. So we just pray for uh, our, our, our own nation, and we pray for the peace of the world, but just a focus on the U.S., Lord God. We just hold the U.S. up, Lord God. Hallelujah. That you would pour in the oil and the wine uh, for the American people on, this, on, the, on the arduous journey on the Jericho Road they're on. So we just release that right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The, 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 the ministry of Jesus through the church, uh, through the Holy Spirit to bring uh, a peace down there, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And I just want to put this out as we just end today. If you don't know Jesus, Jesus is the answer to all these problems. Having Jesus in your heart and uh, knowing his love and being able to share his love this is the Great Commission. This is the way forward for humanity. So if you've never received Jesus, if you don't know him, if you've never asked him to come into your life, I'm just going to invite you right now to receive him. Would you do that? Would you do that? Follow me in this prayer. Dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me. I have sinned. I believe, God, you died for me, and I believe God raised you from the dead. And I want you to be my Savior, and I want you to be my Lord. Come, dwell in me. In Jesus' name we pray this. And all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you.